Hey, what's happening, APOSH kids? Uh, this is Coach Detrale here for our first online lecture here in AP US history. Since this is going to be our first lecture uh, for this year, I wanted to go ahead and uh, give you guys some information on some of the things that I expect and some of the things that you can do uh, as you guys watch online. The first thing that you should expect as we go through these online lectures is that every few slides you're going to have a question that's going to pop up on the screen as the lecture is going to go ahead and pause. I mean, that's really to kind of keep you guys honest with what you're doing and to make sure that you're paying attention to not only what is uh, what you see words on the screen but also what I'm saying as well because I'm going to add some things as well kind of as we go and I want to make sure that not only you're watching but you're also listening to what I say. The other thing that I, I want to remind you of here as well is that one of the expectations of these online lectures is that when you come back to class, you come back with two things. Um, the first one is I want some you or you to be able to share some sort of comment, you know, something that you want to know more about, um, maybe a question that you have um, in some way. The second thing that I want you to be able to do is make some sort of connection. All right, something either that we've learned about um, in another class, uh, for instance, like in world history, so make a connection to world history topics, or as we get deeper and deeper into this course, be able to make connections to things that we've talked about in previous lectures during previous time periods. Now, understand online lectures. I mean, feel free to write down as much as you want. Um, and so this is a great opportunity for you to pause the video and things like that, stuff that you couldn't do in class, which is why I wanted to be able to do this online. So we're just going to kind of jump into this. And so our first lecture here is on Native American societies before European contact. So this is really, you know, this 1491. Columbus hasn't even set sail yet. And we want to look at what their societies were like before the Europeans are going to kind of come in and mess everything up. Our essential question, our uh, first learning objective B, is you need to explain how various native populations in the period before European contact had uh, interacted with the, the national environment in North America. Right, so here's North America. All right, we when you see not only the continent, but we also see economic activities, and you see names on there. And so the big kind of learning objective is this: different native societies adapted to and notice the highlighting there, transform their environments through innovations in agricultural resource use and social structures. All right, so really, our first kind of this big idea here is that Native American groups are going to be very, very diverse. They're diverse not only in their economic activities. You can see on the map they have agriculture, hunting, hunting and gathering, fishing economies. But we also have a lot of different cultures uh, from the Chickasaw and the Cherokee and towards uh, where Georgia is all the way to um, the Salish and, um, you know, the Northwest, uh, as well as the Mayans in the South. All right, so this is going to bring us to our first main or key idea. Now, first main idea, uh, we're going to be looking at the different kind of regions. And so the first one we're going to look at is the Northeast. And we're going to see the Northeast and the Mississippi River Valley. Uh, we're going to see some mixed agricultural hunter-gatherer economies, and they're going to develop uh, semi-permanent or permanent villages. So once again, we come back to this slide, right? The uh, dominated by diverse Indian groups. And so we're going to kind of focus um, in on that area that's along the Atlantic seaboard on the on the right hand side of the map. And so we get a couple different Indian groups, Iroquois, the Powhatans, the Cherokee. Uh, you know, it's not necessarily that you remember every single one of these Indian groups, but you should be able to name one of them um, and then be able to tell us kind of how they lived. And so many of them, they're going to um, settle into small farming villages, maybe just a few large families. Um, you know, we see the their agriculture. They're going to have a kind of a mixed agricultural society uh, where they're going to grow things like squash and beans and corn and what's called three sisters farming. Uh, most of that's done by the women. Uh, many of the men are going to do um, some hunting or fishing, depending on uh, the local geography and the local context of kind of uh, where they're uh, exactly at. And then if we move over just a little bit towards the center of the country, uh, the Mississippi River Valley, uh, we're going to see the Native Americans are going to really use that river system for trade in this particular region. Uh, they're going to develop much larger cities. Um, so, for instance, the, the big one's going to be Cahokia, uh, which is developed on the southern tip of Illinois. Uh, and in the ruins of Cahokia that they've excavated, they found... Uh, 
and found minerals and rocks and things like that from hundreds and hundreds of miles away from Cahokia, just kind of explaining how much trade they did and how far their trade network extended. In fact, their trade network extended all the way to where we're at right now. The Etowah Indian Mountains, just north of us, are part of that that uh, Mississippian River trading network uh, that they had. Now, they also impacted the land that was around them. So not only were these tribes impacted by their environment, but they also impacted the environment as well. So for instance, many of them con uh, conducted uh, prescribed burns to clear hunting land. Uh, they would um, use beaver dams to trap um, and flood and flood regions to be able to trap fish. So they also utilized the environment as well um, and changed their environment to be able to best suit their particular needs. So now we're going to go ahead and move on to another region. And so we're just going to go ahead and move west. And so the next place that we're going to look at is the Great Basin and the Great Plains and how those Native Americans both impacted and were impacted by their particular environments. So the Great Plains are located in that big, you know, green area of Central America, um, central part of North America. And we see a couple major Native American tribes here. We have got the Sioux, we have the Cheyenne, uh, and they're really what we oftentimes kind of think about as being the quote unquote traditional Indian. All right, they're the ones that are hunting buffalo. They oftentimes use mass hunting techniques, uh, such as the jump kill method. I've got a picture here of what that kind of looks like uh, right there kind of driving them off cliffs. Now, oftentimes, you know, popular media wants to, uh, you know, uh, picture a Native American on a horse, but those didn't exist yet in North America. It's not going to be until the arrival of Europeans that the horse will be introduced to Native Americans. And so they're going to have to uh, work a lot harder um, without the horse to be able to capture uh, and kill these, these bison. Uh, but they're going to be very dependent on those bison, very mobile lifestyles, unlike those on the, um, on the East Coast, which had semi-permanent villages. And the, on the East Coast, they would only move when, you know, the, the land no longer was... Um, had been exhausted for uh, being able to grow crops or the, um, you know, there's no more deer or whatnot in that particular region, or they may move during the winter. Uh, let's go ahead and let's continue going west. So if we go out to the northwest, present day California, uh, hunting and gathering, um, and they're going to have settled communities and they're going to rely a lot on fishing. So probably the, the biggest example, the best example are the Chinooks. They're probably the most popular ones. Uh, they're going to use farming and fishing. They're going to build uh, semi-permanent villages uh, built around what was called Longhouse. Uh, they're the ones that built totem poles. Uh, things like that. So we're, we're fairly familiar with them, at least from kind of American art and mythology. But uh, as we can imagine, as you see from the picture on the bottom right hand side, they're going to be very, um, very reliant on uh, fish and salmon and things like that as part of their diet. So they're highly impacted by their particular environment and by their particular geography. Now, finally, our last big idea for today is the importance of maize cultivation and how maize is going to impact the uh, present day American Southwest and Central America. And it's got a few major effects here. So those major effects are supporting economic development, the settlement, advanced irrigation and social diversification. So four big things that maize is. Right. So all of those things is, is Due to maize, right? So those four things, maize made it all possible, right? So maize is is corn, and you see the picture of kind of of what maize would possibly look like. Though they were much more likely to be even smaller than this at this uh, particular time. But what maize was is it was a permanent and stable food source. So Native Americans could then start to focus on other activities rather than just gathering food. They could do other things. They didn't have to uh, travel and find the bison. They didn't have to go fishing all day. They didn't have to hunt deer. They could now do other things. So, for instance, in the American Southwest, the, the Pueblo are going to uh, to have permanent settlements. They're going to start to build these these mounded uh, these these settlements inside the um, uh, the overhangs of cliffs uh, become pretty famous. This particular uh, cliffside dwelling that you see right here had about 300 families within it. 
Now, other things that it's going to lead to as well is to be able to grow corn, especially in some of the arid regions of the American Southwest, you need to be able to bring water to it. So for instance, the Hohokam um, are going to alter their environment. They're going to develop advanced irrigation techniques um, is another impact of what maize was. Now, in Central America, the Aztecs are by far uh, the most important here. Uh, they're going to be, become very powerful. They're going to be able to dominate their uh, surrounding tribes. Uh, their capital city was huge. Uh, you know, the, the estimates are well over 100,000 uh, made up the population of their central city. And, and this rivals the major cities of, of Paris and London, Madrid, and you know, basically big European capitals. It was as big, if not bigger, at that particular time. And the reason why they were able to do that was because of their agricultural production. Because they were able to produce large quantities of food through agriculture, they were able to get bigger. And they were able to be powerful. They could have a standing armies. They could have people that all they did was fight. They didn't have to worry about someone that was a hunter 99% of the time and a fighter 1%. You know, they could have a ruling class. They could have a priest class. They could have um, people that worried about religion and education and all of these other, other things. Um, rather than just hunting for food. So that brings us to the end of our lecture for today. Once again, a few key points is that um, Native Americans impacted their environment and were impacted by their environment in terms of how they lived. And maize had a few very, very large impacts, including settlement, diversification, and irrigation are some of the big things. All right, so remember, bring to class next time, bring your comment, all right, and your connection are the two things that we're looking for for you to bring to class. All right, until then, go pack.